Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'd like to welcome you to episode 198 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, your one-stop shop for all services regarding FCPA Compliance and Ethics. Today I have a real treat for you. I have back Leona Lewis, one of my good friends and colleagues. However, uh, today we talk about her new podcast, which premieres next week titled The Masters of Disaster, and it's going to be a really interesting podcast series on chief compliance officers, compliance practitioners, and their stories. So it's going to be something that I think will be a great addition to the compliance discussion and debate. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing uh, her episodes, and in this podcast, uh, Leona talks about how she came up with the idea, how she's uh, prepared for it, and what she hopes to do with it. The episode comes in in just over 23 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening. This is episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today I am extraordinarily pleased because I have Leona Lewis with me, and that's a reason to be pleased in and of itself, but I'm even more pleased because I am interviewing her about her new podcast that she has founded and will go live shortly called The Masters of Disaster. She will be the second person to podcast in the compliance space, and I'm thrilled to have a colleague uh, leading, uh, helping lead the discussion. So, Leona, welcome. Thank you, Tom. The pleasure is all mine. Well, so, The Masters of Disaster. What is The Masters of Disasters? Well, The Masters of Disaster is a podcast focused on risk, ethics, and compliance. Um, It just, honestly, Masters of Disaster sounded a lot snappier than the Risk, Ethics, and Compliance podcast. (laughs) So so that's why I named it that. But also, it's slightly broader than discussing um, the legal end of of, uh, compliance. I do interview lawyers. Like I interviewed, actually, you're the premier episode that's that's going to be released on September 21st. And then there are two more episodes that are also uh, that are going to be released that same day. One is Jared Bro, and he is a former newscaster and a crisis communications consultant expert. And then the the other is um, is Andrea Bonami Blanc, and we I really know had Andrea. a great conversation. Yeah, great lady. Yeah, she's great. So, and then I also, you know, I've interviewed. So I interview a combination of, you know, people that can talk about their experience related to compliance, risk, and ethics, or so what, skills that are related to that. So, what led you to uh, to found this podcast? Uh, is it a business generation? Is it to uh, be a thought leader? Is it to continue the conversation in the compliance, ethics, and risk community? Is it something else? Well, there are a few things. One is that, you know, as a, as a person who works in compliance, there are a lot of people working in compliance in companies where they're the only um, compliance professional on staff. So, you know, the purpose of the goal of the podcast is to provide that little jolt of enthusiasm that you might get, say, in a conference. That's the goal. The other is that um, is that I did want to continue the conversation. It was a good way for me to be a part of that conversation. And I really wanted to meet people. I will say, having a podcast and being able to reach out and put people um, on the podcast really is helpful in just getting to know people more. So that's why I did it. Well, that's absolutely true. Uh, I, I probably learned more doing my podcast than uh, uh, as much as anybody. So kudos to you for that. Mm-hmm. And also, I think I wanted to capture a point of view that really there wasn't a podcast about. At least, I mean, you had... Certainly, Tom, you've been very successful with your podcast, and 
and I'm really excited to be the second podcast in the compliance space. But I think what the point of view I'm trying to get across is a um, discussion of statutes or legal developments in compliance as much as um, as much as relaying people's like how how people dealt with compliance and crisis and risk or what solutions people can have to become more influential or you know really dealing with actually I think the hard part of compliance which is what do you do because what the law is is actually the easy part I tell people that it's the doing of compliance that counts. It's uh, execution is where the rubber meets the road. So you're absolutely right there. And I got to say, you've been really instrumental in helping me get this started. I I, I have to hand it to you. I mean, it, it, I'm, I, you know, we both attended the podcast movement conference. I think where I really, after talking to you, the approach I wanted to take really crystallized. I think without your involvement, this wouldn't be as clear as it is now. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I hope to be a facilitator of many further conversations and people enjoy, and joining in the community leading these conversations. So I did want to, that brings up a good point because we did both attend Podcast Movement 2015. Uh, it was not a legal compliance conference. It really was podcasters. And I wanted to get sort of your thoughts about uh about uh, that conference that conference was really inspirational and you know there's not there are a lot of opportunities to speak to so many people who are starting podcasts and have to frankly explain to so many people what you're intending to do with your podcast in any form and it was a great resource to get uh, technical help and recommendations on different internet tools for podcasting, and just, you know, how to leverage social media to promote the podcast. It was it was um, also interesting because it, it, I think it's just a watershed moment in the popularity of podcasting right now. Um, a lot of the big names from national public radio, like the producers of the podcast Serial were there, in you know people who were very uh successful who were actually also very accessible at the conference right so that was that was fun uh I talked to Gordon Firemark, who you met there and introduced me to, and he had, he ended up interviewing me for his podcast mm-hmm. and he said something that I found very interesting. He said that he really enjoyed being with a group of people he related to as podcasters. And he asked mm-hmm. me about that, and I said, you know, my my experience was very different. I I didn't feel like I was part of the group. I felt like I was an outsider looking in, because I still think of myself as a lawyer, and that's the group I belong to. And it was very interesting that uh, maybe it's because of his uh, entertainment background, but uh, mm-hmm. I really felt like an outsider looking in. I learned a lot, and I got a lot of information, but. I didn't feel a part of the community. What, did you have any sense of that yourself? I felt that, you know, it was hard to – it was a really interesting bunch of people there from all walks of life. It is dominated by young techies. And I will say that I'm used to that environment in the – I mean, I used to work for Best Buy, which is dominated by young techies. And – and uh, also is very, very focused all the time on how things are being received by the consuming public. So so issues like branding and promotion and, uh, you know, those kinds of issues are things that I've had a lot of experience in, or at least, you know, at least by osmosis. So, so I, I felt – as much of a part of this conference is really a legal conference. Although I will say I didn't talk as much about the law because because uh, people were not necessarily that excited. When you say you're a lawyer in the pod, in the podcast universe, people are like, okay, that's nice. And they're not that it doesn't it doesn't light them on fire. So so getting over that 
um, being able to communicate and get people interested in the topic that I was talking about actually was the, the conference was really good for that. Right. And um, also, um, you know, what I used to be the chair of the Environmental and Sustainability Committee at the Association of Corporate Counsel. And I keep in close contact with a lot of the people I met at, there. But as part of that, I used to um, plan a lot of programming. And so I would contact people and put them on the program, and we'd try to get, you know, notoriety for the program or see what people are interested in in the program or how it did. And and so I I love doing that. So I think it just – the idea of it just plays a little more to my strength than – you know, av- you know, having been in a publicly facing company, I mean, a publicly facing big consumer brand. Right. One of the things uh, I got out of the conference, and I think you did too, is we met a couple of people who really challenged us on uh, what, give me three words or three sentences about what your podcast is about, really synthesize down. Mm-hmm. The message you're trying to put out. Um, somebody actually said that to me. Well, you know, what are the three sentences that describe your podcast? Did you get uh, a sense of being challenged and in, in to, to come up with a short, distinct message of what your podcast is yeah. about? Definitely. Definitely. People didn't ask me that question in so many words, but that was the challenge, right? I mean, right. when you would meet people, you'd explain what your podcast is. And I kept – I, you know, I continually try and refine the message to be clearer and clearer and see what what captures people's imagination. But this because, one of the things that I started, I try to think about is when I hear those kinds of questions, how can I take that message to the compliance practitioner? And how can the mm-hmm. compliance practitioner then use that information to craft a message to send down to his customer base, which are the employees? Right. And how can right. you grab the how can you convey information quickly yet have meaningful content? Yeah, it's it's that's a challenge. I mean, when I was working, of course, in the retail industry, um, people were extremely aware that you had one shot at communicating a message to 150,000 retail employees, and you couldn't change the message. Or it would be really hard to change the message because you can't you 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 just create more confusion and you it honestly undercuts your credibility to change that message to all those employees right now, you know I've also have a client who is a a bank internally they don't spend as they don't feel that sense of urgency when it comes to what they're telling their internal employees. I will say they are very um, they are very risk averse and they're very interested in compliance, but they constantly seem to be changing the message, and they also leave it to a lot of people to try and interpret what they're trying to say from the central um, offices, and that's a luxury in retail you cannot have. Um, you know, in a bank you have. These are not, uh, you know, high school students necessarily. I mean, these are these are people with educations who can handle a higher level and more complex messaging. But but still, it's a lot of people, and with scale of a lot of people, landing that message clearly becomes super important because it's not just how sophisticated they are; it's how many. Could you say that last uh, sentence again? It's not how sophisticated it's, they are. It's something. Yeah, else. it's not how sophisticated your audience is. It's how large your audience is. Because each person is going to take with them their interpretation of what you say. So make the clearer the message, the less room it is for them to interpret it differently than you intended. That's a really important insight, Leona. And I've never heard it put quite that way. So you might want to think about saying that a little bit more often. Yeah. (laughs) 
And I, I can certainly I see yeah. how your experience at Best Buy would really inform your opinion on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's um, getting, you know, people in stores are flooded with messages. You're going to have to say one message over and over. It better be clear, and it cannot change. So the seriousness you take in what you say is very high. And a large part because of the volume. I mean, it, it has. It's if I, we just had ten stores, it would have not been the issue it is with a thousand stores. Let me let me ask you this: in terms of the messaging and the consistency of the messaging, did you ever find there was a point where the consistent message you put out, you put it out so consistently that it either induced sort of listener fatigue or people were just turning off because mm-hmm. they thought they had heard it before? Yeah, it, it, it's different at different levels. Um, sometimes it seems like there's message fatigue at the executive level, but not necessarily at the at the line employee level because the line employee um, hasn't heard it nearly as much as you, maybe you've been talking about it at the executive level. Like you can talk about something at the executive level forever and then um, – and and it doesn't trickle down to the line employee very often. The the other is, is because there's a certain amount of experience and branding that goes on whenever you're communicating with anyone from the compliance office. I mean, there are certain things like you don't want to be seen as chicken little. You don't want to cry wolf. I mean, you you want to be able to explain why some things are riskier than others. And you want to enable the executives to make a decision they feel good about because they have all the information they need to make the decision. And also, it's important to be proactive so you avoid unnecessary drama. Because I think... (laughs) I mean, really, that was like a big part of what my job was, was actually (laughs) being proactive so people felt smart about the issues before they heard about the issues due to a a crisis. Right. Because then, and we'd figured out how the communication flow would go in advance because it just takes out a huge amount of drama. I mean, needless drama. And, And also, in those situations, there's a lot of risk because there may be a lot of attention paid to an issue that isn't that risky when you really have another one that's a lot bigger. But in the moment, it seems urgent. That's really a very, uh, uh, another important insight. I hope you will listen to this podcast and mind some of these topics I haven't heard you articulate on so much because you really said a very important thing. You phrased it in a way I laughed at, which was don't avoid trying to avoid the drama but it's it's about the communication and information quality and the channels mm-hmm. that it moves through. And that's something that we really, don't, I think, focus on enough, certainly in, in the compliance space that I play in as much, is the communication flow. Right. Uh, right. The- and it's, 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 from my point of view, critical to showing the value of the – part of it is to show the value of the compliance team. Because you want to be able to, the compliance team to create an experience for those executives that make them feel like they're on solid footing with the compliance team. And you really never want to waver, you never want to get away from that goal. Even mm-hmm. though you will have emergencies, you will be called into action on things people didn't expect, that will all happen. You just want to have it happen less and not on a routine basis. Right. So, you know, I, in my past life, I always focused on what experience do we want the board to have about compliance? And then, or what experience do the merchants need to have about compliance? Because we we kept talking about compliance in different areas, like different fields of compliance. But really, you know, the, the merchants just wanted us to tell them what to do. And so we kind of changed our approach and gave them what they what they asked for, which was more 
like a, a program that was more centered around what they are concerned about rather than rather than how we saw the law i mean it, it we had a uh, like a wizard that you could check off on SharePoint. You could check off different attributes of a product, like does it have a battery? Is it a rechargeable battery? Is it plush? Does it have characters on it? And could pop out all the policies that that related to those features. Because, you know, having education based on, well, this is toy compliance, and this is battery issues, and that, it, you really need an interface to like make that usable to people who are like, I don't know, I just want to get this stuffed electronic bunny onto the shelf. You know, right. how do I do that? So you you kind of have to answer what their question really is, not what what how you see how compliance is divided up, like as as legal topics. Leona, I think you have proved the thesis or one of the thesis you started out with, which is putting on podcasts is a great way to learn because you've taught me quite a bit today about messaging and the channels of communication. And while we could continue this conversation for uh, quite a bit, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time. But before we left, I wanted uh, to see if you could uh, uh, tell the, our listeners where the Masters of Disasters will be found, uh, if, uh, and then once again, give us uh, the dates that you're going to go uh, premiere your first episode. The premiere episodes are being uploaded to iTunes on the 21st of September. So they will be on iTunes. They will be on Stitcher. They will also be announced and available on a Facebook page, Masters of Disaster Podcast and on my website, www.complyethic.com. You can also sign up to be on the mailing list for the newsletter and receive uh, alerts by email. So there are a lot of different ways to get in touch. Well, Leona, I'm really looking forward to your podcast. Like I said, I'm really thrilled that uh, you have joined uh, the rather small FCPA compliance uh, podcasting community, and you have actually now doubled our size. So uh, <laughs> that's the other reason I did that it's, because it's, I was looking around and I'm like, you know, this this little niche in pie casting is not very big. Maybe the time is now. So nope, you're absolutely right, and uh, I hope that uh, we can continue the conversation. And I greatly look forward to uh, to uh, checking in. Uh, we're going to be uh, posting weekly. Yes, posting weekly. Okay. And the, yep. the 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 podcast will be about between ten and fifteen minutes long. And will you so it's not, try to post not on one day? Content. Are you going to try to post oh, on Monday? One, Monday. Every Monday. Okay. Yeah, every Monday. One of the one of the things I learned from uh, podcast movement is try to consistently post. So uh, I try yeah. to post on Tuesday and Thursday, but you'll be posting on Monday. Well, that's great. On to know. Monday. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again, and I greatly look forward to uh, hearing your first uh, few episodes. Thank you. All right. All right. Tom Fox again. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I have two requests for you. The first one is if you could go to iTunes and rate this podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. The second is if you have any questions that you'd like answered in my upcoming mailbag episode, please email them to me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thanks again for listening and I look forward to visiting with you again soon.